In the year 1940, Robert Madison graduated from East Technical High School. East Tech was one of just a few trade schools in the United States at the time. It was the only one in Ohio. In 1946, he returned from vicious fighting during World War II to his hometown of Cleveland, Ohio, and settled in the Glenville neighborhood. The Glenville of 1946 was a changing place. In 1930, Glenville was known as a Jewish neighborhood with individuals of African-American descent making up just 8% of Glenville's population. By the time Madison moved home, it was more than half African-American and rapidly overcrowding. Madison, who had possessed a passion for architecture since he was young, knocked on the door of Case Western Reserve University's School of Architecture that July. The story goes that he was denied because he was a person of color. Madison returned the very next day wearing his army uniform and military decoration. Cleveland of the late 19th and early 20th century was generally regarded as a relatively tolerant city. During and after the American Civil War, the ACS, or American Colonization Society, proposed an exodus of black Clevelanders. However, the Cleveland leader commented that there was but very little favor from our colored citizens. There was relatively little reason for Clevelanders of color to emigrate. The overall economic standing of Cleveland's black population was higher than that of most black communities during the 19th century, rivaled by only New Orleans. In northern cities, blacks in the eastern metropoles of New York and Boston were primarily low-paying and unskilled laborers. In New York around the same time, nearly 75% of all blacks worked as servants or unskilled workers. Only 6% owned real estate. Percentages were similar for other large cities such as Philadelphia and Atlanta. In the years before and after the Civil War, Cleveland's community of color had an aura of respectability. Cleveland had grown rapidly in the years after the war, as had the black population. Urban workers were mobile and land use was unpredictable. What was a farm today could be an office tomorrow. Cleveland was a commercial city, not an industrial hub, and opportunities reflected this. In the 1880s, Cleveland possessed a fully integrated public school system. African Americans had sat on the school board. Theaters and public facilities did not segregate blacks. The population was fully aware of the uniquely integrated status of their city. Influential figures like John, Father John Malvin were militant about integration. William Day and John Howard were other influential figures and members of the city's black middle class. Howard, often a member of the Cleveland School Board, encouraged this full racial integration as a way to keep equality at the forefront of the city's identity. Integration would be a constant reminder of the achievements in Cleveland as well as the work still to be done. John Malvin exemplified the drive and adaptability of these middle class leaders. He had worked as a cook, a sawmill manager, a canal boat captain, and eventually a small shipping magnate, each time presiding over a completely integrated crew. By the time of his death in 1880, nearly a third of Cleveland's African-American population were skilled workers and professionals, whereas only one-tenth of Cleveland's white population was past the working class. Between the Civil War and World War I, urban society in America underwent a tremendous transformation. Urban populations doubled, then tripled in a few decades. Cleveland had been designed as a walking city, but this model was obsolete by the 20th century. Inventions like the public bus and electric streetcar allowed for a more tightly organized urban landscape. It made possible an exodus to the suburbs, and urban populations soon sorted themselves by racial socioeconomic group. Immigrants to Cleveland's east side coincided with the flight of the native white inhabitants. The black middle class community had been small, Many moved to the posh developments between Howe and Superior Avenues. They were not restricted to this area, but when they lived in other sections of the city, they were more likely to settle near each other. Three such black enclaves existed before World War I. Locals still boasted of Cleveland's diversity and equality. They claimed that there was no Little Africa in Cleveland. There is not a single street in this city that is inhabited by nothing but Negroes. But the trend towards segregation had begun. Immigration booms in the late 19th century doubled the black population alone. While new immigrants from across the country and world filled out much of the city, discrimination against newcomers resulted in many of Cleveland's traditional ethnic enclaves. Little Italy, a small Chinatown, Slavic Village, Irish in Ohio City, blacks from the south along Central Avenue, 
Central housed more than half of Cleveland's black population, almost none of which were part of that old middle class. Vice districts and unsavory neighborhoods, such as New York's famous Tenderloin, the Badlands in Columbus, and the Heights area in Detroit, sprang up across urbanizing America. Cleveland saw its own neighborhood of saloons and dens of ill repute, located along Central Avenue, the heart of the developing black community. The Cleveland Gazette, a black newspaper, noted with dismay the proliferation of speakeasies, gambling, and questionable houses, catering in an ironically egalitarian way to immigrants and natives, blacks and whites alike. There were some attempts to reform these districts, spearheaded by civic-minded individuals of all colors. Reforms were ineffectual, short-lived, or faltered in the face of corruption. Notable racketeer Albert D. Starlight Boyd paid off half the city council to look the other way. The early 20th century was the nadir of American race relations. The end of Reconstruction in the South contributed to the Great Migration, transplanting many people of color to larger northern cities. Cleveland, as already described, substantially grew thanks to these immigrants. The sudden surge of working-class blacks, along with growing nativist sentiments, helped to shatter Cleveland's egalitarian atmosphere. Stereotypes of southern blacks were pervasive in northern cities like Cleveland. One result was stronger measures in housing to keep residents away from certain neighborhoods. The neighborhood along Central Avenue pushed eastward. With increasing concentration of blacks, the integrated schools that John Malvin and William Day had fought for disappeared. This did not destroy the middle class. There were countless examples of individuals that took on new roles within and around the city to cope with changing times and circumstances. The black middle class did not decrease in size, but it did decrease in proportion. From 1915 to 1930, it went from being more than a third of all black residents to barely a tenth. The middle class now thrived on businesses that catered to their new neighborhoods. Proprietors were small food stores, restaurants, small retail stores, and professional occupations that offered services to a hyper-local community. The House of Wills is a funeral home that grew to be the largest funeral home in the state, in part because of its services and hosting functions for the black community in a time when other public facilities barred black gatherings. J. Walter Wills operated it for decades, though the structure now lies abandoned. His wasn't the only funeral home. Leyland French owned a series of parlors across the city that catered to white and black alike. He even hosted a predominantly black Republican club, a predecessor to the City Club of Cleveland. Businesses, by nature, had to be local and cater to local audiences. M.C. Clark founded Dunbar Life Insurance, offering services when they weren't available to African American population. Ultimately, though, the jobs that the middle class had thrived on the jobs that Cleveland's black population had been built on were intimately connected to whites. When white customers disappeared, so too did the businesses, and so too did the middle class. The canary in the coal mine was the declining importance of black barbers. The Negro barber is losing his ground in his city, said W.E.B. Du Bois in 1900. Between 1870 and 1930, the percentage of barbers citywide had dropped from 61% to nearly 0%. The same held true for other professions. Similar drops occurred for waiters, caterers, and clergymen. Black leadership underwent a fundamental shift. The integrationists' time in the sun was over. They had fought against discrimination as well as black-only secular institutions. In 1929, Herbert Chauncey became the new face of Cleveland's colored middle class. He was a charismatic businessman who was not native to the North, having come from Eastman, Georgia. He founded a series of businesses, Empire Savings and Loan, People's Realty, and the Crusader Insurance Society. Chauncey made his fortune by catering to his fellow African Americans' needs. He advocated for separate institutions and spoke loudly of developing group economies based in the developing ghetto. Chauncey started a movement that continued through to the Second World War. The so-called New Negro Movement in Cleveland affiliated with the National Urban League to solve problems with chronic overcrowding and ghettoization that churches and local government had been unable to fix. Some members of the New Negro Movement became power brokers in their own right. Leroy Bundy was clearly the most dynamic, working as a dentist and entrepreneur within the city. 
Bundy operated businesses that catered to whites and white employees. His notability as a businessman allowed him to transcend race and align himself with local power broker mayor Fred Molman. He gained favorable patronage from the black community while simultaneously incurring the hatred of whites. He would eventually join the city council after a brief stint with Marcus Garvey's African nationalist movement. This all changed with the onset of the Great Depression. The majority of black businesses went bankrupt. The number of black lawyers and teachers dropped to single digits. The Great Migration was over. Cleveland's sizable black population was thoroughly working class and used its clout to push for change and reform. Several times throughout the 1930s and early 1940s, Cleveland elected blacks to its city council. Cleveland's black middle class all but disappeared. Those that remained moved their residences out of Central or Howe and into the suburbs. This was the world that Robert Madison inhabited. His Cleveland was a place of intense racial divides. His city still saw de facto segregation in its makeup and de jure racism in its laws. Even so, Cleveland's best days were ahead of it, true. It would not be the shining symbol of integration it once was, but nor did it gain the associations for slums that New York or Philadelphia did. Cleveland saw modest gains throughout the 1940s and 1950s. Even with the urban decay of the 1960s, the Howe riots and white flight, Cleveland's black population maintained an entrepreneurial reputation. Privileged or established backgrounds of Leroy Bundy, John Malvin, or Herbert Chauncey, Carl Stokes grew up in one of the nation's first federally funded housing projects. He grew up just south of Cleveland's famous central neighborhood.